caregivers for our aging population is made possible by Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield. For more than 75 years, Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield has been committed to creating stronger, healthier communities through corporate grants, sponsorships, and program support. Learn more at highmark.com slash community impact. We've got 2.2 million Pennsylvanians right now who are over the age of 65. As the number of seniors rises dramatically. There is uh, tremendous growth as the baby boomers uh, age and we live longer and longer. People have serious questions about who will take care of us as we age. We have a system that's not really geared for helping older adults move across care settings. Care settings in hospitals, nursing facilities, and more often at home. We use the living room. <clears throat> You're okay. And I'm just wiping your mouth. As a caregiver, you actually being sent home asking to take care of injections, caring for wounds, take care of intravenous fluids with little or no training. So how will families get that training? Pennsylvania has passed the CARE Act to address some challenges, but how will it work? Who will it help? Home care is gonna be one of the top two or three most talked about topics over the next five years. Talked about from the highest levels of government and talked about at community centers like this, Take me out to the ball game. Where innovative programs are helping older people and their caregivers. For the caregivers, I think a lot of it was being able to relax, being able to share in a musical experience. It's a growing and evolving issue, especially for those who want to or must keep their loved one at home. Sometimes it's like I'm on call 24-7. Sometimes I'll say, Bob, I want to go off duty now. Dead. Three of us, of my siblings, wanted him to be home so we knew that he was getting the care that he needed and then most importantly loved. Balancing all of that is a challenge. Love, obligation, stress, finances, worries that will likely affect all of us. It is about a hundred percent chance that everyone will be a caregiver at some point in their lives. Daddy, we're gonna comb your hair. Jody Houston is a caregiver. I'm a caregiver for my father, Donald McCreary. And so is her brother, Bob, who lives with their dad in Enon Valley, Pennsylvania. It's about an hour northwest of Pittsburgh. It would be very hard for one person to do this all the time. She's dad. Despite the constant care their father needs, Jody and Bob hold on to many precious memories of their dad when he was younger. The once vibrant, fun, and hardworking man drove coal mine trucks for a living. Now he's 86 years old and doesn't leave this room. He's been bedridden for five years. He went into the hospital from pneumonia and a urinary tract infection. And when he came home, he couldn't walk. On top of that, he's in the end stages of Alzheimer's disease. And like many children of aging parents, Jody saw that coming. He came up to visit me, and it was three hours taking him to get there. He had forgotten his way there. And then it just became more and more a forgetfulness. And then eventually, he didn't remember our names. He just remembered our faces. And then he just quit talking one day. Next came the decision about where Donald McCreary would live the rest of his life. The family turned this living space into a makeshift hospital room. We just have supplies. We've bought wedges, anything that he could possibly use, we, we have bought for him. Want some more? Jody's family considered a skilled care facility, but they worried not just about the level of care, but about the cost. For a good nursing home in this area, it's about $10,000 a month. Three of us, of my siblings, wanted him to be home so we knew that he was getting the care that he needed, knew that he was being fed, changed, and then most importantly loved because, you know, there's a lot of us that come to visit a lot and spend time with him. 
This family is among millions of Americans who have opted to keep aging or dying loved ones in their own care. In fact, 80% of people who need care have either stayed in their own home or moved in with a family member. Hello. And that means a need for more health care workers. Hospice comes. We have a bath aid that comes three days a week. And then we have a RN that comes two days a week. 1.3 million jobs in the home health care field are projected through the year 2020, an increase of nearly 70 percent. Hey, buddy. How are you? Penny Haas has been Donald's hospice care nurse for several years now. Hospice provides end-of-life care for patients and support for families. Tom, and get your blood pressure again. I know you don't like this. Among Penny's duties, okay. keeping tabs on vital signs, nutritional yeah. needs, and skin care. And his uh, decline has been slow. Right now, he's on a spiral down. Um, he's eating less. He went from sitting in a chair now to bed fast. Uh, he does have a blister that turned into a wound to his heel. So we are addressing that. And with his poor nutritional status, that is not going to heal. If it does, you know, we'll be very, very lucky and very grateful. Because she's not there every day, part of Penny's job is to teach families how to care for their loved ones. We educate, we encourage the family to do the dressings. We are not here seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So we want to make sure with educating the family on how to use our bed supplies, depends, pull-ups, wipes, reposition a patient without hurting themselves. All those things play into caring for the patient. Oh, we just love her. She's wonderful. She comes in here and she's so good with my dad. She is like our family. Jody and Bob have plenty to do too, making sure every shift is covered, changing dressings, and keeping their dad clean. We have a schedule every day. We keep track of what time we give him medicine, when he has had something to drink, if he's eaten, if he's, you know, went to the restroom. We keep track of everything, so it's a routine. Donald McCreary's family is determined to give him the best care possible. Still, the reality of caregiving can sometimes be daunting. There's always somebody who has to keep an eye on him in case he needs changed or you know, he would start coughing and, you know, or vomiting or something. Yeah, it does get to be so emotionally draining on you watching everything decline. So the biggest satisfaction I get is I know he's being truly taken care of. If taking care of Donald's generation is a challenge, a greater one lies ahead. America's baby boomers are already transitioning into retirement age. The number of seniors in 2014, 46 million. By the year 2060, though, that number will more than double. And when considering the states with the oldest populations, the Keystone State is right up there at number five. The fastest growing segment of our population is the 85 plus population. And that's increasing very rapidly as people live longer. Ray Landis is the advocacy manager for AARP in Pennsylvania. The thing we like to say about caregiving, of course, is that if you're not a caregiver right now, you probably were at some point or you're going to be in the future because family caregiving in our society is such a critical part of our, our long-term services and support system. Mildred Morrison heads the Area Agency on Aging in Allegheny County. A caregiver is somebody who cares and then does something about it. It is really that simple, but it's most often a family member. But changing times have changed the faces of caregivers. Used to be that role fell to the unmarried daughter. She's the one who's perceived as, well, she has time to care for mom and dad because she doesn't have a family of her own. And that traditional role is still carried in many families, except she increasingly lives in another town. She isn't living in the same house with her parents, which was once the quite common practice. And it's that changing role in lifestyles of women has greatly affected who becomes a caregiver, who else needs to step up 
And sometimes it's now a shared responsibility among many relatives as opposed to just one person. That's the basic arrangement Jody has with her brother Bob and other family members. They share responsibilities, but no matter the arrangement, it can all be too much at times. I can go home to my family. I have a 15 and a 17 year old daughters and my husband. And I just go home mainly and just spend my time with them. Or I can go to the you know grocery store or so forth. My brother, not so much. He's here 24 seven unless he has a doctor's appointment. And then I also have a nephew here that lives and also he's here most of the time too. So I can go home and escape in the, you know, a movie or honestly a nap. And getting away is a good thing, if only for a few hours. Get somebody to come in and help you. If you can, just to go even to the grocery store or, you know, go to church, just so you can go do something. Down in the valley, valley so low. For many, that getaway is where they find a supportive, nurturing environment, like here. This is musical therapy for people with Parkinson's disease and their caregivers. It's the final day of an eight-week pilot program at Wallace Memorial Presbyterian Church in the Green Tree suburb of Pittsburgh. Singing brings people together, and making music brings them together. Music actually can change the brain. So it's root, root, root for the whole team. If they don't win, it's a shame. Among the participants, Anne Early and her husband two, Bob. Three strikes, you're out at the old For them, it's a bright spot in a day filled with many challenges. That was great. That was Yes, I just can't get over doing that. Bob is a retired math professor at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. His Parkinson's diagnosis came in 2010. The degenerative condition affects nerve cells in the brain, causing tremors, muscle, and speech problems. Bob is living with all of that and more. Matilda, you'll come a wall, say Matilda with me. In a way, it's like having a, a young child that I have to take care of, and somebody even said it's like a special needs child. Some, sometimes he even gets confused about how clothes work. Sometimes he's looking for something, some pants to wear, and he brings a shirt, and he thinks that that's pants. This is not the rule, but it, it's happened lately. Anne has been Bob's one and only caregiver. It's not that she wants it that way, but the couple doesn't have any family living nearby who can help out. So, with no one to relieve her, finding alone time is a big priority for Anne. Sometimes I'll say, Bob, I want to go off duty now. Sometimes always things come up at bedtime and I, I'm so anxious for him to go to sleep so that I have some time when I'm not going to be interrupted with something. It's changed me and him and I've changed our relationship. The demands can be overwhelming and the list of caregiver health problems can be endless. Anxiety, depression, exhaustion, trouble sleeping and or concentrating, drinking, smoking or eating too much. Existing health problems can get worse and above all. There's this underlying resentment. I feel and I imagine I'm not the only caregiver. Why did I have to be in this position? Anger, especially with the cognitive, it's why are you torturing me like this? What I see in the caregivers that are stressed out, it is overwhelming to think about everything that you have to do. Dr. Judith Black is a geriatrician who also volunteers her time at the state and national level to improve care for seniors. First, as a caregiver, you have to step back and get help. And that's not easy because there's not one door you go through and you get all the help. Second, you have to take time for yourself. And how do you do that when you're so overwhelmed? Let's go, come on. To escape her daily challenges, Anne also finds solace in nature and in her dog. When I wake up in the morning and I'm feeling low, I get out of bed. Once I see out that window and look out the tree like this, 
it switches. Okay. I take our dog out. Bring stick. Come on. Bring. You don't have to do big things. Sometimes just little things. The other part is that there are caregiver support groups. And talking to other individuals who have been caregivers can be extremely helpful because they can share strategies that work for them. Ann and Bob are members of other Parkinson's support groups, including this one. At first, Bob was apprehensive, but now... He's singing, he gets a drum and he'll fool around and be somewhat of a smart aleck. But, um, so it's a process. What we're doing with singing is helping your Parkinson's. Michelle Muth is a board certified music therapist. She helped design these sessions. In neuroscience, they're finding how music interacts in the brain. It stimulates dopamine. It's one of the only external stimulus that will stimulate dopamine in the brain, which with Parkinson's, you're losing your dopamine. All right, now do it with a na. No! All right, he's trying to get your voice up in here rather than down here. The singing and the music produce dopamine, so therefore they associate a positive experience with that. So that's why, yes, it affects mood. And that's great for both the person with Parkinson's and their caregivers. Judy Ann Candle was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2002. It was one of the best choices I made to go and become a part of the group. It's actually good for your vocal cords to sing high and sing low and not only use them at one level so that I can stretch them. And I think that that's one of the things that troubles us with Parkinson's. The fact that not only do we get rigid in our bones and our joints, but in our throat as well. And say, over the river and through the woods, to grandmother's house we go. I find with Parkinson's, the camaraderie between people with Parkinson's and caregivers is, is very genuine, it's very warm. There's so many other women that are going through what you're going through, and it just helps. When Ann and Bob arrived for today's session, they chose not to sit next to one another. Michelle says that's okay just so that they could have their own space and share in the experience and using music to bond in that way. I want to remind them and have them, tell them to sit straight. And so lately I've been sitting away from them so that I don't get, get tempted to do that. So it's root, root, root for the I, I like going, I like talking. I met uh, another caregiver and uh, we're gonna try to keep in touch. The social connection's great to have people of like mind. Organizers hope additional funding will keep the music program going. So my bottom line is I'd love to see this going. I'd love to see it grow so we can reach more people who would benefit. I wish we could keep it up. I'm gaining from it. Three strikes. Bob, after the first two or three meetings, he kind of has kicked in and gets more involved. And I, one time he made a joke and I said, uh, the real Bob Early's coming out. Yeah, you really needed to be an umpire, I think. For what my life needs. <laughs> Some programs help caregivers emotionally, but what about financially? Family caregivers spend about 20% of their annual income providing care for a loved one. That averages out to nearly $7,000 a year. And for people with dementia, they spend even more. Advocacy groups are lobbying Congress to pass the Credit for Caring Act, which would give family caregivers a tax credit of up to $3,000 to help offset the cost of care. When we look at the hospital versus the nursing home versus the home, you know, hospital stay is going to average approximately $1,800 with regards to a daily cost. And these are national averages. Dr. Brian Holzer is president of HM Home and Community Services. That's Highmark Health's post-acute care organization based in Pittsburgh. Dr. Holzer also runs the Health Care at Home program for the Allegheny Health Network. When you think of a nursing home, a skilled nursing home, you're talking about nearly $400 a day. 
And when you compare that to be able to care for a patient through a home health care company, you're talking about an average of $145 per day. And so again, it can dramatically differ. That difference is what sparked the creation of innovative companies like HM Home and Community Services. There is hundreds of companies across the state of Pennsylvania that deliver home care, hundreds that deliver home medical equipment, hundreds that deliver home infusion therapy. What makes this unique is that we have bought, owned, and now control the entirety of all of the siloed parts, and we've created a model that's the sum of the parts. Providing home health services is one way to hold down costs, but other efforts are taking place in government to help the growing number of Pennsylvanians caring for aging loved ones at home. As ARP has, has gone out and, and investigated caregiving more and more, who have said it's the hardest job they've ever had uh, because of the, the uncertainty and the lack of training of individuals in a family to, to take on some of the, uh, the tasks that they are expected to take on as, as, as caregivers. And that is why Pennsylvania passed the CARE Act, which stands for Caregiver, Advise, Record, Enable. When someone is in a hospital, it's, it's a time of confusion, a time of crisis. To help offset that confusion, the CARE Act requires the hospital to identify the patient's caregiver, make medical records available to the caregiver, notify the caregiver of the patient's discharge. And most importantly, to provide that caregiver with some instruction and some training before their loved one is discharged so that when that discharge takes place and the loved one goes back to the home, that the caregiver is prepared and knows what to do an untrained caregiver is one of the reasons too many people end up back in the hospital. The CARE Act hopes to reduce the number of readmissions when it goes into effect in April of 2017. But will the medical community be prepared? Actually, hospitals are already doing that to some extent. There's been a great push to improve transitions of care over the last several years. Any shortness of breath or chest pain? The important thing about the CARE Act is that now every hospital will be doing it, both from the biggest hospital in an urban center to the smaller hospitals in rural areas. And the hospitals have had some time now to train their staff. Some critics say the act doesn't go far enough in helping caregivers or those they care for. Still, for many, it's a start. Hospitals at AHN are working to strengthen the training of their staff so that they can have a more interactive educational process with the caregivers. So yes, I do believe it will help, but it is only one piece of the puzzle. As a country, we haven't looked into a lot of research about how to help our caregivers be effective. Until then, people like Jody and her brother Bob are doing the best they can. Despite the challenges, they're content with the decision to care for their father at home. I cherish every day that I'm here, that I would get to see my dad, and there's not a time that I don't leave her, that I don't kiss my dad and tell him I love him because somewhere in there he knows that. He knows I'm his daughter. Remember we drove there with John and... Anne Early is still learning to navigate her life as a caregiver, and she has some advice of her own. Take care of yourself. Make sure that you carve out things that you like. Like with me, it's Come working on. with my dog. Come on, boy. For now, most of the burden of caregiving falls to families who look for help where they can get it, from the top levels of government to the neighbor next door. Break the leaves, cut the grass, shovel the snow, don't ask, just do it. I got one neighbor that mows part of our lawn, and one neighbor walked the dog for us. You don't have to do big things, sometimes just little things. Words of experience from someone who's been there and says she'll always be there. One thing I've started telling Bob, that I love him and I always love him, and sometimes I don't feel like it. And that's okay, you know, you don't have to realize you love somebody all the time. And I tell him, I'm not going anywhere. I'm always going to be here. And sometimes I'll get mad. That doesn't mean I don't love you. I always love you.